Okay, now for our, really our first big application of derivatives to sort of physical problems. Section 310 is on uh, related rates. So what we'll do is have a lot of stuff moving, things changing with respect to time. So we'll have things that are functions of time. We wanna know how those things relate and how their rates relate. So we'll get an equation relating the things, we'll differentiate it with respect to time, that'll give an equation relating the rates. So on the surface of it, it's that simple. My experience shows me students struggle with this material. Uh, the reason really not being the calculus, you're good to go on the calculus, more than getting the problem set up seems to cause folks problems. So we'll make it very step-by-step -step and very mechanical um, and work a pile of examples. So in this section, we'll find a relationship between various quantities, each which changes with respect to time, each which is a function of time. We'll differentiate that relationship implicitly. That'll introduce uh, derivatives with respect to time of these so-called various quantities. Derivatives with respect to time or rates of change, the implicit differentiation will do with respect to time, gives relationships between these rates of change and that's the reason it's called related rates. So let's just uh, start it. We've got really nothing uh, technique wise new. Let's work an example, something uh, first off that's uh, very easy to visualize, I think. And they're gonna ask us uh, three questions about this sliding ladder. And we'll go through, we'll, we'll follow this protocol we're about to state, but I wanna work an example first and then we'll give a step-by-step -step protocol. And uh, <clears throat> you might re-watch the video and find that, yeah, we're following these steps precisely when we go through and even work this first one. So the situation here is as follows. A 13 foot ladder is leaning against a house when its base starts to slide away. So ladder leaning against a house, here's the wall, one end's on the wall, the other end's on the ground, and what's happening is uh, the ladder's slipping and falling, uh, the ladder's attached to the house somehow mechanically, maybe and somebody's pulling this end along the ground, whatever, there's movement and the ladder's moving with one end attached to the house and the other end attached to the ground. You're given the information, by the time the base is 12 feet from the house, the base is moving at a rate of five feet per second. So that means uh, the base is 12 feet from the house. Okay, so that'd be this distance here. Here's the base of the ladder, here's the house, and there's that distance that changes with time because the ladder's moving. When that distance is 12 feet, then the base is moving at a rate of five feet per second. Then this end of the ladder is moving to the right at five feet per second. Uh, if this ladder were slipping, you might be able to visualize this a little bit. Um, you'd expect it to accelerate as it went down and kind of crash into the ground. So it's not moving, uh, I wouldn't expect, uniformly uh, in terms of this motion. But we'll set up relationships, we'll get relationships between rates, and we'll plug in the information they've given us. And uh, they, as with all of these problems, kind of pick a point in time and isolate it somehow or other. The point in time, remember this ladder sliding around, the point in time they've really given us is fixed by the fact that uh, the base of the ladder is 12 feet from the house. Notice, this is the picture from the book, they've set up some X and Y coordinates. So they're telling us this distance along the X axis is 12 feet. That's the point in time we're interested in. The question is, how fast is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall then? Then being that point in time, being when X equals 12 feet. Uh, and secondly, at what rate is the area of the triangle formed by the ladder, wall, and ground changing then? Okay, uh, here's the area. 
we got a right triangle, so be easy enough to find the area of it. Uh, it'd be one half base times height, easy enough for a right triangle, but the base and the height, they change with time. And part C, at what rate is the angle theta between the ladder and the ground changing? Then, then being when x equals 12 feet. And um, this, this five feet per second will play a role as well. So they've introduced this angle theta, an angle between the ground and the ladder, and they wanna know how fast that angle is changing at this particular point in time. So this is really three related rates questions. Um, so we'll cover a lot of turf in this one example. And here's what we're gonna do protocol wise. Okay, uh, this is calculus one, so we wanna differentiate something. First, we have that the distance from the top of the ladder to the ground, y, as indicated here, and the distance from the bottom of the ladder to the wall, this distance here, these things change. They're functions of time. So we'll denote them as x equals x of t and y equals y of t. Ladder moves uh, the coordinate of this point and the coordinate of that point where the ladder touches the house and touches the ground. They move with time. The rate at which the base of the ladder is moving as a function of time is dx dt, derivative of x with respect to t, how fast this coordinate changes with respect to time. The rate at which the top of the ladder is moving is dy dt, the rate at which this coordinate changes with respect to time. Now one quick observation, uh, the situation they've set up, the bottom of the ladder is moving to the right as indicated by that little arrow there. So dx dt must be positive, x is increasing. Here, this point where the ladder meets the house, the y coordinate, uh, top of the ladder is dropping, y coordinates decreasing, and that derivative must be negative, by the way, just from the fact that they've given us a situation where bottom of the ladder is moving to the right, so top of the ladder is moving down. That has implications about the signs, the SIGN signs, the plus or minusness of the rates of change of x and y with respect to time. Okay. So the question in terms of these symbols is, uh, how fast is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall? dy dt equals what? That's how fast the ladder sliding down the wall. So dy dt equals what? When x equals 12 feet, they told us the 12 feet thing, and dx dt equals five feet per second. The base is moving at a rate of five feet per second at this particular point in time. So at that point in time, in other words, dx dt equals five feet per second. So we've introduced symbols. We've taken the question and translated it into a question involving those symbols. It's fine dy dt is really the question given some other information. So we need an equation involving dy dt. How about this? Let's find an equation involving y and the other stuff that changes. And the stuff that changes is uh, the x coordinate and the y coordinate. So if you will, x changes and y changes. Um, we'll probably set up equations where I don't write the of t stuff every time. It's understood, it's related rates that these things change with time. Uh, so we'll suppress that and just use x and y in relating x and y. Uh, anything else change? Yeah, well, theta changes, but I don't want to talk about that one just yet. We'll talk about that one in uh, part C. But for the part A, uh, X changes, Y changes. Um, so, hey, here's a right triangle. I bet we can relate X and Y using this right triangle. Also, the hypotenuse is the ladder, and that's always 13 feet. So the hypotenuse doesn't change, yet the X changes and the Y changes. Okay. So ladder forms a right triangle. The lengths of the sides are uh, x for this bottom side, y for this vertical side. Uh, hypotenuse doesn't change because the ladder's a fixed length. So Pythagoras tells you we get the relationship x squared plus y squared equals 13 squared. <coughs> uh, uh, 13 squared is 169, it's constant but there's a relationship between the variables X and Y. You're asked a question about what? You're asked a question about dy dt. 
Well, let's take this equation that relates x and y, differentiate it implicitly with respect to time. That'll introduce a dy dt. It'll introduce a dx dt as well. But we were given information about dx dt. So differentiate with respect to time, x squared plus y squared and, and the constant. Uh, remember, x and y are functions of time. So we have a composition of functions. We'll have to use a chain rule. The outer function is a squaring function. The inner function is x as a function of time. Outer function here is a squaring function. Inner function is y as a function of time. So in the past, when we did implicit differentiation, we usually had y as a function of x, and we differentiated with respect to x. Here, we've got everything as a function of time, and we're differentiating with respect to time. What that's going to mean is a lot of chain rules, and uh, probably a fair amount of product rules and quotient rules as well. X and Y are both functions of time, so differentiate both of them implicitly with respect to time. Derivative of x squared would be 2x chain rule times dx dt. Derivative of y squared would be 2y chain rule dy dt. The derivative of the constant is zero. We were asked a question about dy dt. So let's solve this right here at the bottom. Solve it for dy dt. And we get dy dt equals negative x over y times dx dt. There's a relationship between the rates. Yeah, granted, this is a relationship between the rates as well, but let me rewrite it simplify, if you will, because of what they've asked us about. They've asked us dy dt equals what? Okay, so I'm going to write uh, dy dt in terms of x and y as given there. Uh, here it is. Go to the next slide. And to repeat the question, the question was dy dt equals what when x is 12 feet and dx dt equals 5 feet? And we know dy dt is negative x over y dx dt. So all we got to do is plug in if we know everything. Well, I know dx dt at this point in time, it's five feet per second. Uh, I know x, it's 12 feet. I don't know why. Uh, so we'll have to find y. But we have a relationship between x and y. From the right triangle, x squared plus y squared equals 169. So at this point in time, I'll emphasize that, things are changing. They want us to know how they're changing at a point in time when x equals 12 feet. When x equals 12 feet, then what does y equal? Well, it's a special triangle. It turns out y equals, uh, here it is, y equals 5. Plug in, we'll get 12 squared plus y squared equals 169. y squared equals 25. y equals 5 feet. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, y equals negative 5 feet would make sense as well, but these are distances. And for physical reasons, I take the positive square root ignore the, the negative five feet, though that does satisfy the equation and I could put some sort of meaning on that if I was stubborn enough. But given the picture we have, we're interested in y equals five feet. So at this point in time, granted x changes and y changes, but at this point in time when x is 12 feet, then y is five feet. So we can plug into this equation and at this point in time, find dy dt. We then have at the desired point in time, dy dt is negative x over y dx dt. Uh, x is 12 feet, right? They gave us that. Uh, y is five feet, uh, we figured that out. And dx dt, they gave us that as well. They gave us that as five feet per second. So substitute those numbers in. It's not a bad idea to keep up with units throughout this. I, sometimes I will, sometimes I won't. It depends how messy it is actually but I'm being very conscious of units because if the units are wrong and I've done something wrong and the problem's wrong, we're talking a rate of change of Y with respect to T. Y is a, y is a distance here. You should be feet per second. Uh, and indeed it is. So look what you get with substituting in the 12 feet over five feet. The feet's cancel just like numbers would cancel and you're left with feet per second. So uh, it, that's the correct units. Also, the fives cancel. Actually, you're left with negative 12 feet per second. They've chosen nice numbers for you. Uh, does that make any physical sense? Well, this is something we ain't got to address much in the past, but now we're doing physical questions. Is negative 12 feet per second, is that, is that meaningful? You okay with it being negative? Yeah, uh, Y is decreasing. That's the rate at which it's decreasing, apparently. 
the magnitude of that number, the, the fact that it's negative 12 uh, feet per second, that I might have a little bit trouble visualizing. And I don't have a real intuitive grasp of that because it came from all this calculus stuff, really. So um, it, it, I am comforted by the fact that the units are right and the fact that it's negative. It should be negative because y is decreasing. So there's your first related rates question. In part B, they ask us about um, an area. Part B, the question was, uh, same setup, at what rate is the area of the triangle formed by the ladder, wall, and ground changing? Okay, that'd be this triangle right here. Uh, we need the area of it. Uh, we already know some stuff from above. We want that uh, rate of change of area when uh, X is 12 feet. We know from part A, when X is 12 feet and DX DT is five feet per second, then we found Y is five feet uh, and we found DY DT is negative 12 feet per second. That's all the information we extracted from the first part. We may not need all of it, but we'll see. So area, let's write area as a function of X and Y. The question is, What's the rate of change of that area when X equals 12 feet and this other information we found from part A? X equals 12 and DX DT were given. We can find the Y and DY DT. We, we did that in part A. So we know all of this stuff, whether we need it or not, we got it. Area is one half base times height. We got a right triangle here. The base is X and the height is Y. So the area is one half X times Y. So piece of cake, finding that formula. In my experience, this is where students struggle, is finding a relationship between the things that change. I'll give you a list of things that we'll usually use. Uh, it may not be an entirely exhaustive list, but I'll give you a list of the, the important formulas that we usually use in finding relationships between things that change. Uh, <clears throat> you're doomed if you can't find this relationship because then you got nothing to differentiate. So if you get stuck here, uh, you got problems. Well, I'll try to help you through those problems by telling you things to focus on and giving you a list of suggestions of what to try. Here, we want the area of a triangle because it was a question about the area of a triangle. Fine, area of that triangle is one half base times height. It's one half x, y. What you gonna do next? Um, the precise question was at what rate is the area of the triangle formed by the ladder wall ground changing. At what rate is the area changing? They want to know dA dt. Fine, we'll differentiate this with respect to time and that'll give us a dA dt. It'll give us a bunch of other stuff too. We know quite a lot after part A, it turns out. <clears throat> so let's differentiate this relationship with respect to time derivative with respect to t of a, that is a derivative with respect to t of uh, x times y divided by two. <clears throat> Let's bring the two out front. The derivative of a with respect to time is dA dt. That's the thing we're looking for. At what rate is the area changing? So they're looking for dA dt. Now we need to differentiate x times y with respect to t. x and y are both functions of time. That's a product of functions of time, so I have to use a product rule. So that would be the derivative of the first, the derivative of x with respect to t, that's dx dt, times the second, y, plus the first, x, times the derivative of the second, derivative of y with respect to t, differentiating with respect to t, must differentiate implicitly both x and y. So that produced um, a bunch of rates of change and a bunch of x's and y's, well, one of each. But, but all of those things, and we know all of those things at this point in time from part A. So we get dA dt equals, uh, if you like, it's y dx dt plus x dy dt divided by two. At the desired point in time, uh, we had, what was it, let's see, x was 12. So we'll put a 12 there, there's a 12. Uh, we had y was five, remember that? We saw for y, so y is five. Um, we had, D, we had dx dt is five, that was given in the question, rate of change of the base, dx dt is five feet per second, so we got feet per second there. 
dy dt, that's what we found in part A. That was uh, negative 12 feet per second. So substituting in all the information we know, we get this, you simplify, it simplifies down apparently to a negative 119 over two uh, square feet per second. Sure about those units? Yeah, we get a foot squared per second here and a foot squared per second here. Yeah, foot squared per second, square feet per second. So the units are right for rate of change of area where we measure lengths in feet and time in seconds. Uh, it's negative, does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah, I think so. I mean, the ladder's falling. Uh, I'm pretty confident the area of that triangle is getting smaller at this point in time. Now it's true the X value is getting larger and the Y value is getting smaller. So there's some interplay between those two. Uh, but I think I'm comfortable with, uh, gee, when, when X is 12 and Y is five, that ladder's really, um, it's not horizontal, but it's, it's not very steep at that point in time. And yeah, I think the area of the triangle is decreasing then. So I'm, I'm happy with the units, square feet per second, that's a rate of change of area. Uh, and I'm happy with the negative. Uh, that area, I have a physical feel, it's, it's negative. Um, now the 119 over two part, I don't have a real physical feel for that. What's that? Uh, 59 and a half square feet per second. Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, I'd have to recheck the calculus on that one. But when you deal with these physical questions, it's a good idea to see if the answer makes sense. Because if they ask you um, how fast the area is changing and you get miles per hour, something's wrong because that's not a rate of change of area with respect to time. It's a rate of change of uh, distance with respect to time. So having the right units is something to check. Whether it's positive or negative is something to check. And if it's a question you can visualize, um, checking the magnitude is a good idea. Usually that's a little bit harder. Uh, the fact that this is 59.2 negative feet squared per second. Uh, the magnitude is usually not so intuitive. Yeah, well, that's why you need the calculus. Uh, but when you're doing something physical, and this goes for physics and engineering questions, it's good to see if the answer makes any sense, for one thing, and find obvious mistakes. All righty. So um, there's two related rates. In part C, they ask us about the rate of change of this angle theta. So we're going to have to do something a little bit different. We're going to need an equation that involves theta. Any ideas about how to drag theta into an equation? So far, we've got all our mileage out of um, the Pythagorean theorem and the formula for area of a triangle. Angles. Um, I need to relate that angle theta to the x and the y, and maybe the 13. Uh, well, it's in a right triangle, so we ought to be able to use a trig function. In part C, they ask us, at what rate is the angle theta between the ladder and the ground changing then? i uh, got some good news for you. Then is very well defined for us. That point in time, we know a bunch of stuff. Uh, we know x, we know dx dt, we know y, we know y dt, we know all that stuff from part A. The question is, uh, representing that angle is theta, as the picture says. The question is, d theta dt equals what at this point in time when x and dx dt and y and y dy dt are as determined? All right. We got a right triangle. Let's use a trig function. Okay. Uh, you want to use sine, cosine, tangent. Um, I've written it up in terms of tangents. X and Y both change, fine, theta changes as well. You got another idea? Well, I could do some stuff with cosine. Cosine of theta would be adjacent over hypotenuse. That'd be X over 13. So it's one less variable. You might be attracted to that. Uh, I wrote it up in terms of tangents because I know so much about X and Y. I know stuff about the hypotenuse as well. So this isn't the only way to do it. Uh, but certainly we could use uh, actually any of the six trig functions to relate theta to these other things because you can differentiate all six trig functions. I chose tangent. 
So tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. That's y over x in that right triangle. Let's differentiate. All right, so we'll differentiate the relationship tangent theta is y over x, and we'll differentiate it implicitly with respect to time. Composition of functions on the left, the tangent function and the theta function. Theta is a function of time too, right? It changes with respect to time as the latter moves, the angle changes, it's a function of time. So this is a composition of functions of time, the outer function is a tangent function, the inner function is theta of t, if you like. What's the derivative of tangent? Secant squared, rewrite the inner function, chain rule says multiply by the derivative of that inner function, d theta dt. Of course you'll need a d theta dt, that's what you're looking for. Right hand side, we got a quotient. Well, I might use a quotient rule. No big deal, derivative of the numerator, the uh, numerator's y, so that's a dy dt, times the denominator x minus the numerator y times the derivative of the denominator x with respect to t over the denominator squared. Let's solve for dy dt because that's what we're looking for. So divide both sides by secant squared. We get a one over secant squared on the right hand side, one over secant cosine. So let's write it in terms of cosines of theta. So here's d theta dt in terms of things we know. Uh, I'm not sure I know that just yet. Well, we can figure it out though. You know dy dt, you know dx dt, you know x and y from part a and from the question. Just you don't know cosine theta. All right, we'll figure out cosine theta at this point in time. We know all the x stuff. Uh, what's up with the cosine of theta? Well, let's maybe run back and look at the triangle. I claim the cosine of theta at this point in time is 12 over 13. X is 12 at this point in time. Let me go back to the previous slide, move to picture. So at the point of time of interest, granted everything changes with time, we're interested in the time when this is 12 and this is five. When this is 12, the cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. It's 12 feet divided by 13 feet. It's 12 over 13. Uh, I could find the other trig function similarly. So 12 over 13 is a cosine of theta at this point in time. So we'll plug that in for the cosine theta. So at the desired point in time, dy dt, negative uh, 12 feet per second, part a. x, x is 12 feet, that's given in the problem. Minus y, we figured out y is five feet in part a. When x is 12, y is five. dx dt, we were given that in the statement of the problem, that was five feet per second. Uh, x we were uh, given was 12 feet. And cosine theta was 12 over 13. Trig functions are unitless, of course. So there you go. Um, let's check uh, units and sine. All right, so we do the arithmetic. Um, we get 112 times negative 12, negative 144, uh, negative five times five, it's minus 25. Denominator, 12 squared is 144. Uh, 12 squared is 144 from this, and the denominator is 169. Lo and behold, it reduces the negative one. And the units, let's see, we got feet per second times feet. So here we get feet squared per second, uh, feet squared per second divided by feet squared. That just leaves you with per seconds. Uh, is that right? d theta dt is negative one per second. Um, are the units right? How are we measuring angles? Well, in terms of radians, of course, and radians are unitless. So you might prefer to interpret this as negative one radian per second, but remember we measure angles in unitless radians. So you don't write the radians down. You won't write the radians down, you can write ahead. Uh, it does look maybe a little more aesthetically pleasing, uh, but we've produced units of per seconds and, and that makes sense when you're talking about a rate of change of an angle because angles don't have units when we measure them in radians. The radians doesn't pop up in any of this. Radians are a unitless measure of angle. Uh, how about negative? It makes sense that angle's decreasing yeah, the ladder's falling, and it was the angle between the ground and the ladder. So, yeah, the angle should be decreasing. So, I'm happy with the units. 
after some thinking on it. I'm happy with the fact that it's negative. Um, the fact that it's negative one, I'd have to track to trace through all this, this computational stuff again. The magnitude, I don't know about. The sign, I'm, I'm happy with, and the units, I'm happy with. So there's our first example, first three examples, really, of a related rates problem. So let's make this as mechanical as we can and set up a list of steps and we'll always follow this list of uh, five or six steps. I think there's six of them. Let's go through the first three. All right, so here's our protocol when solving related rates problems, and this is how we work those three questions we just had. Draw a picture. Name the variables and the constants. Use T for time. Assume that all variables are differentiable functions of time. In the picture we had, we had X and Y, and 13 in that triangle formed by the latter. Uh, in part C, we had X, Y, theta, and maybe 13. We didn't use the 13 in part C, but we could have. Could have done that one a different way. But we drew a picture and we labeled the things that change with variables and the things that didn't change with constants. Some things change. X and Y changed. Some things didn't. The length of the ladder didn't. So. Don't go nuts putting variables everywhere. Put them where you need them. Put the variables on the quantities that change. Don't put variables on the quantities that don't change. Label them with their numerical values. Problem is, you're gonna have things changing and they're gonna probably ask you, like with a ladder problem, when X equals 12 feet, then <clears throat> what's a rate of change? Well, now they're not saying X always equals 12 feet. It's not a constant. It was changing because you labeled it with a variable. It was a function of time. We were interested in the point in time when X equals 12 feet. So you need to practice these to dissect how they're using the words really. Step two, write down the numerical information in terms of the symbols you've chosen. Uh, the dx, dt, dy, dt's, they usually give you uh, something about rates of change information. In the ladder problem, they told us um, how fast the bottom of the ladder was moving. They told us dx, dt was five feet per second, for example. Step three, write down what you're asked to find. In that ladder question, you were asked to find how fast the top of the ladder is moving, dy, dt, in part A. In part B, you were asked to find how fast the areas change it. D capital A, DT, where A represented area. In part C, you were asked about D theta DT, how fast the angle was changing. Next. Oops. Write an equation that relates the variables. All right, that's the part I told you. This is where uh, students tend to get a little bit stuck sometimes. And I'll give you a list down below of some useful things to use to find relationships between variables. You may have to combine two or more equations to get a single equation that relates the variable whose rate you want to the variables whose rates you know. All right. Uh, I don't think we quite encountered that with a ladder. And we, maybe we did when we had the tangent relationship. Um, but I need relationships between the relevant variables. I'll give you a list here shortly. Let's finish up this six step thing first. We used um, what the Pythagorean theorem, the formula for area and a trig function relationship in the three parts of the ladder problem to do step four. Step five, differentiate with respect to T. All right, that's the calculus part. And actually that's probably the easiest part because you should be comfortable with this. The only thing I can imagine you could mess up with the differentiation is, Remember, everything that's a variable is a function of time. So you've got to use chain rules, product rules, quotient rules, all them rules still apply because you'll be differentiating implicitly. This is how the book words it, but when you differentiate with respect to X, you'll be differentiating implicitly with respect to X. So there'll be DX, DTs, DY, DTs, D theta, DTs flying all over the place because you're using the chain rule, because you're differentiating implicitly. 
and essentially plug the numbers in. Uh, one of the main reasons I've made this step by step is don't you plug no numbers in until the very end. You got some things that change, you're interested in a point in time, like with that ladder, you had those X values, yeah, but they were changing. X didn't equal 12. There was a point in time when it equaled 12 and that information I used right at the end. If you'll reanalyze what we did in the uh, ladder problems, we didn't plug numbers in until after we had differentiated. So differentiate near the end and at the end, plug in the numbers. And you know, I'd almost add a step seven. See if your answer makes sense. Are the units right? Uh, is, it the, is it positive when it represents something that's increasing? Is it negative when it represents something that's decreasing? Maybe just a quick little check on that. But there's our six formal steps. I'm worried about you on step four in relating variables. Given my vast years of experience and teaching calculus for I don't know, three and a half decades. Here's some things you'll use. Uh, the first one we've already used, the Pythagorean theorem for right triangles. If you're dealing with something that's got right triangles in it, I bet you you're using the Pythagorean theorem. Could be you're using trig functions like we did in part C of the latter problem. Um, using ratios of edges of similar triangles. We'll do a couple of examples that require similar triangles. It's standard questions in, in this material, but similar triangles are a useful thing to get relationships between things that change. Uh, for a sphere of radius R, FYI, just to have this in front of you in one place, the volume of a sphere of radius R is 4 thirds pi R cubed. The surface area of the sphere of radius R is 4 pi R squared. Um, we might talk about uh, inflating a spherical balloon in which case we could talk about rates of change of volume or um, how fast a rubber balloon, how fast the surface area changes as you inflate it and ask a DSDT question. Uh, the volume of a right circular cylinder of radius R in height H is pi R squared H. Uh, a can of radius R in height H has this volume. Uh, the surface area of such a can is, um, well, right circular cylinder, I should call it. The surface area is 2 pi r h. Uh, if you exclude the, the top and the bottom of the can, the flat ends of the cylinder, if you include them, then you add on a, a 2 pi r squared to one, a pi r squared for each of the ends. And the volume of a right circular cylinder, a cone, sorry, sorry right circular cone, uh, of base radius r and height h is 1 third pi r squared h. Uh, like a Dunn's cap or a, a conical um, ice cream cone, a Dixie cup. So let's look at uh, several examples and we'll go through and follow those six steps. So we'll go step by step through this, may get this in the background in case we need to come back and look at it. Okay. Speaking of cones, draining a conical reservoir. The story is, water is flowing at the rate of 50 cubic meters per minute from a shallow concrete conical reservoir, vertex down, of base radius 45 meters and height six meters. Part A, how fast in centimeters per minute is the water level falling when the water's five meters deep? So it's a rate of change question. Part B, how fast is the radius of the water surface changing then? Give answers in centimeters per minute. All right, step one, let's draw a picture. So we're dealing with uh, a shallow concrete conical reservoir vertex down. So it's, it's a gigantic uh, cone 45 meters in radius, six meters uh, in depth at, at the center. Uh, so the diameter is like 90 meters, like a football field wide. Uh, six meters is what in the ballpark of 18 feet. It's pretty deep, too. This thing's gigantic. Um, my picture here, maybe not quite to scale. Uh, I think I've kind of magnified the vertical dimension so you can see it better, but I tried to draw it in perspective here. 
and it's got water in it. All right, now the water is being drained from this thing, so the amount of water changes. The cone doesn't, the tank stays in the same shape, but the water at some point in time uh, will also be in the shape of a cone. It'll be a cone that's got uh, dimensions similar to the dimensions of this cone. Similar triangles will play a role when we take a cross section, which we effectively did in the lower picture. But the, the water's depth changes and the water's radius changes. And they say something about the radius of the water up here. So let's label those things with variables. Let's let H represent the depth of the water. It's the height of a cone, so that's why I want to use H. <clears throat> and R, let that be the radius of the water. So step one, we drew a picture. We labeled um, the things that vary. And up here, we've labeled the things that don't with constants. All right. Um, part two was write down what you know. Uh, we'll let the volume of the cone of water be uh, V. We were told that the water is leaving the conical tank at 50 cubic meters per minute. So the DVDT, the rate of change of volume with respect to time of the water in the conical tank is negative 50 cubic meters per minute. Uh, negative because it was going out of the tank. The water level will be dropping. The radius of the water will be decreasing as a consequence. We're interested in the point in time, as they told us, when the water's five meters deep. The question in part A, let's go back and read it. Uh, how fast centimeters per minute is the water level falling when the water is five meters deep? Yeah, so there's their time, five meters. They set it with the uh, what we've labeled as H. When H equals five meters is what we're interested in, water level. Well, the water level's H, so the question is dH dt equals what? When? We were told the rate of change of volume is negative 50 cubic meters per minute and H equals five meters. H changes, R changes, R is nowhere in the picture just yet, but uh, H and R both change. We wanna know how fast H is changing at this point in time. So there's the question in terms of the symbols. So far, we ain't even done any math. We drew a picture and we took their words and turned them into our symbols. Part four, we need an equation. This is a step I'm worried about, John. An equation that relates uh, V, H, and possibly R. Certainly V, because I know things about dVdt. Uh, certainly H, because we're asked a question about dH dt. And, hey, um, the water forms a cone the volume of a cone, just stated this in the notes, is one third pi r squared h. Uh, don't expect you to memorize these, but um, we'll use them a lot. So there's a fair chance you'll start remembering these things. So the volume of a cone is one third pi r squared h. We've got r changing and we've got h changing. Yeah, we don't know anything about h. Uh, we know depth, I guess. H equals five meters. Oh, it's R. We don't know anything about R, excuse me. Um, up here, they, they had H's and V's and, and more H's. So there is no R stuff up here. I think we can get rid of R. By similar triangles uh, between the tank and yellow, the right-hand part of the tank, and between uh, the left-hand part of the water, the ratio of this dimension 45 to that dimension six should be the same as the ratio of this dimension R to that dimension H. Those are similar triangles, same shape, different size. So the ratios of their sides are the same. I promised you some similar triangle stuff. And we must have the relationship R is to H, R divided by H, as equals 45 meters divided by six meters. R divided by H equals 45 over six. A uh, common multiple of three in there. Um, also, they're both measured in meters, so the meters cancel. Uh, common multiple of three, so that simplifies to 15 over two. <clears throat> and we can write R equals 15 H over two. So let's get rid of R because 
They didn't ask us anything about R, not in part A, part, part B they did. And we don't know anything about R. I don't, you don't know, you don't know nothing about the rate of change of R. In fact, that's the question in part two. So let's take R out of the picture because we can using similar triangles. So my motivation is, I don't know anything about R except how it's related to age. So let's use that and get rid of R. They didn't tell us anything about R, though we could maybe figure out when H is five meters, what R is. I suspect we could. <clears throat> um, in fact, using this relationship right here. Uh, but let's just take R totally out of the picture because of the kind of question they asked. If you don't, the differentiation is going to be trickier, but doable. And you're still going to end up having to have this type of relationship here because you don't know anything about R other than the similar triangle stuff. So um, this is an example. I may be doing some things that might on the surface of it appear uninspired, but I've been doing this a long time. Uh, it isn't, and I got my reasons. And that's my reasons. I don't know anything about R. Let's get rid of R. If I didn't know anything about H, I'd get rid of H and do everything in terms of R if they gave me that kind of information. But you can't argue with the validity of the substitution R equals 15H over two. So let's plug that into the volume. And then the volume is one third pi 15H over two times H. R equals this quantity here. We had one third pi R squared H. And there's the volume in terms of H. Now, does that make sense that you could figure out the volume simply by knowing the depth of the water? Sure, you know the shape of the tank. So if you know how deep the water is, you ought to be able to figure out the volume of the water, measuring only the depth, the, the H parameter, because you know the shape of the tank. You go to the gas station sometimes and when the, they're refilling the tanks underground. I take a big ruler and dump it down in the tank and see what the level of the gasoline in the tank is. But they could care less about the level of the gasoline. They want to know the volume of the gasoline because they sell you gallons of gasoline. Well, it's the same idea. If you know the depth, you can determine the volume because you know stuff about the tank, you know the shape of the tank. Probably more simple for a gas, an underground gas tank. But what we get here is volume is a function of age, and it makes sense that we can figure that out because we know the shape of the tank. All right, how are we doing? That was part four. You follow the calculus so far? Yeah, there wasn't any. Well, it's time. So part one was draw a picture. Part two was kind of write down what you know in terms of the parts of your picture. Part three is write down what you're asked in terms of the variables you've introduced in the picture. Part four is find a relationship between those variables. That's the trickiest part in my experience. Part five is differentiate this relationship implicitly with respect to time. That'll introduce a DVDT. Fine, they told us DVDT. That'll introduce a DHDT. Fine, they ask us about a DHDT. It'll also have some H's in it, you okay with that? Yeah, they told us a when, and they told us by giving us an H value. If I differentiate this with respect to time without getting rid of the R, it'll have DVDTs, excellent. DHDTs, excellent. H's, fine. R's and DRDTs, and I don't know anything about R's and DRDTs. So it's in hindsight that I'd go back and do this kind of uh, substitution if I wasn't on top of things. So differentiate this with respect to T is next. If you hadn't substituted, you'd, you'd find that you got to go back and do it in hindsight. So you'd figure it out eventually. But differentiate with respect to T. And we get a DVDT. Uh, 70 pi, uh, 75 pi over 4 is a constant. Differentiate 3x, um, differentiate h cubed with respect to T. That's 3H squared, chain rule, DHDT. Uh, and we can rearrange that. Solve for DHDT. Why would you do that? Because that was a question, DHDT equals what? So take this equation, rearrange it. I've skipped some algebra steps. Pause the video and convince yourself that the algebra is correct. But we get DHDT in terms of H and DVDT. And I know both of those. 
Uh, if we hadn't done the substitution, there'd be R's and DRDTs, and then I'd have to deal with that. How would you deal with it if you hadn't done the substitution earlier? Um, similar triangles. So I'd have to go back and do the similar triangle thing now. I did it earlier and it saved me a little bit of work. The differentiation was easier than it would have been by having R's and H's in this formula here. But you could do it. All right, so let's substitute in a uh, sixth and final step. The important thing is don't plug any of those numbers in until after you've differentiated. <clears throat> That's really the main motivation for the steps method. So we've got uh, when dv dt is negative 50 cubic meters per minute, uh, when h is five meters, then plug in. We get dh dt is four over 225 pi uh, five, we can talk about meter, uh, talk about units here in a second. Um, dv dt is negative 50. Okay, plug in there. How are we doing on units? Um, the negative 50 would come with meters cubed per minute. H would come with units of meters. Well, meters squared because of the exponent of two. We'd have meters cubed per minute divided by meters squared. That'd leave meters per minute. Yeah, that's the right units to have on the rate of change of the depth, meters per minute. Uh, simplify the arithmetic, uh, leaving it at a precise value. We get negative eight over 225 pi meters per minute. You happy with the units? Yeah, it's a rate of change of the depth of the water. It should be in um, distance per ton, and it is. Um, you happy with the negative? Yeah, you're pumping water out of the tank and the level's falling. So it should be negative. The numerical value, that's where I get stuck. And I don't have a lot of intuition for that. Uh, this is kind of a small number. I'm surprised by that. Well, remember, this was a gigantic tank. You're draining it. And I don't know, 50 cubic meters sounds like a pretty big chunk of water, maybe about the size of a... Um, about the size of a car. I'd say the volume of a car every minute. But remember, this this tank was um, what was it like a like a football field wide and uh, 18 feet deep in the center. I don't know, that's kind of a small number. Well, that sounds plausible. Only little thing was it's the wrong units for what they asked. The book says I want the dimensions in centimeters per minute. All right, fine, we'll, we'll convert it for. Them. So we'll take uh, dh dt is negative eight over 225 pi <clears throat> meters per minute. There's 100 centimeters per meter. So we'll use this conversion factor. The uh, meters will cancel, leaving you with centimeters per minute like they wanted. Um, see, uh, 25 goes in this like nine times and in this uh, four times. Simplify. I'll leave the arithmetic to you, the simplification to you. And we get negative 32 over nine pi centimeters per minute, uh, just to make it somewhat physical. That's about uh, negative one centimeter per minute. Centimeters, what's that, about the width of your thumb? Uh, okay, I guess that's that's plausible. The, the units are right and it's negative. That part I'm satisfied with. The magnitude of that number, yeah, that's plausible, I suppose. Uh, they did ask a very subtle thing on here. Uh, they talked about the level uh, that the water is falling. So I don't know if you want to include the negative or not. Uh, I did. Uh, technically, the level of the water level is falling at a rate of 32 over 9 pi. Uh, the negative indicates the falling. I don't know. It's decreasing. I kind of like leaving the negative in. Uh, so, uh, the negative certainly is the value of dh dt. Uh, however, we present it here, it's debatable maybe. But the magnitude is certainly 32 over 9 pi. I say negative because dh dt is negative. <clears throat> so, there you go. We followed the six stats. We drew a picture. Uh, we discussed what we had in terms of the variables that we put on the picture. Uh, we wrote down what they gave us, what we know from the question in terms of those variables. Step four, we found a relationship between the variables. We even tweaked it a little bit to make it a nicer relationship. We differentiated step five, we plugged in step six. Isn't there a part B to this? 
Oh yeah. How fast is the radius of the water surface changing then? Uh, then was, uh, it's gone because it's stated in part A. Then was when H equals five meters. Oh, and, and all that stuff from part A applies at that point in time as well. Well, we had a picture above. We're interested in the point in time when H equals five meters. The question is, how fast is the radius of the water surface? That's what we had labeled R. So the question is dr dt equals what? When uh, the rate of change of volume was 50 cubic, negative 50 cubic meters per minute, they gave us that. Uh, H equals five meters, they gave us that in part A. Uh, and we knew some other stuff. I guess we knew dh dt was negative 32 over nine pi centimeters per minute at that point in time. That was the answer to part A. So there's the question. And at the point in time, we know some of these other things. We might need to know some more stuff. We'll see. We need to relate this time r to the other variables. Well, we already did that. We saw in part A, that R was 15 H over pi. It came, it came from the similar triangle stuff. So I'm really recycling the part A information here. We knew R equals 15 H over two from the similar triangles. So there's your relationship between the relevant variables. Uh, what comes after finding the relationship between the variables? This is related rates, the differentiation. So we'll differentiate both sides with respect to T. Yeah, it's a piece of cake on this one. Left-hand side, dr dt. Right-hand side, 15 has uh, dh dt. And you know what dh dt is because we found that in part A. So final step, when we picked a point in time, we had dv dt, we had h, we had dh dt. Uh, we didn't have R itself, but we could figure it out. Turns out we don't need it. Uh, we needed uh, 15 halves dh dt. So we get 15 halves, negative 32 over nine pi, produces 80 over um, three pi uh, using the centimeters units because they wanted everything in centimeters per minute. So take that rate in terms of centimeters per minute. The answer we had to part A. And there you go. Simplify, it looks like we get about uh, 8.49 centimeters per minute. Oh, there's a little typo here. Well, I'd, I'd like to say I meant to do that, but there's a typo here. Uh, you happy with the units? Rate of change of radius with respect to time? Yeah, it should be distance per minute. You happy with the sign? No, I'm not. That radius should be decreasing because the water level is decreasing and the radius is going to be decreasing in that conical tank. I made a mistake and dropped a negative sign. So this negative sign should carry over to here and over to here. It should be negative. Glad I double checked. I'll update that in the online notes. But I'm happy with the units. When I fix that, I'm happy with the sign of it. The magnitude, I, I'm, I don't know what to tell you about the magnitude. I guess that's a reasonable rate of change. The, the dimensions are huge. I, I don't have an intuitive feel for how fast these things are changing. That's why I needed all that calculus stuff. But I'm happy with the units and when I correct it, I'm happy with the sign of it. Let's do another one. Okay, this one also relates to a cone, uh, relates to a coffee maker, actually. Coffee is draining from a conical filter into a cylindrical coffee pot at the rate of 10 cubic inches per minute. You know, structurally, this is like the one we just did. They got a conical tank uh, and they're draining water out of it. Well, they're draining coffee out of it this time. But that's, uh, well, that's really similar to what we just did. The math part will be similar at least. The question is, how fast is the level in the pot rising when the coffee in the cone is five inches deep, part A. Part B, how fast is the level in the cone falling then? All right, these folks, um, They've got two things. They've got the filter that has coffee that's leaving it, and they've got the pot, uh, presumably it's cylindrical. They've given us in their picture, they, they've given some dimensions of it. We've got a cylinder of diameter six down here, and volumes going into that cylinder. Part A, how fast is the level in the pot rising? So we're interested in 
the cylindrical pot below, how fast is the level of the coffee rising then when the volume changes at this rate? And part B, how fast is the level of coffee in the filter uh, dropping then uh, when the depth is five inches in the filter? Let's draw a picture. They've given us kind of a picture in perspective. Yeah, I really need a cross section so I can go through and label the things of interest. So we'll draw a picture, but take cross section of the picture, label the things that are constants and the things that vary. All right, we got two things going on here. We got a filter and we got a pot. So let's label the dimensions of the filter with little subscripts of F and a pot with little subscripts of P. We're told that the filter in the picture told that the filter has a diameter of six. Okay, so the filter has a radius of three. It's a radius that matters when I talk about volumes of cylinders, or sorry, cones. It's the radius that matters uh, and the height. So the radius is three inches, the height is six inches uh, for that conical place where the coffee filter goes. The coffee sitting in that cone has a radius that will vary. Let's label that R sub F, radius, filter, and H sub F, height, in the filter. They ask us about uh, how fast a hot run. Coffee in the cone is five inches deep. Okay, so when H sub F equals five is the point in time they're asking us about. Uh, down here in the pot, we'll idealize this as a cylinder of radius three inches, right? They've, they've given us a, a diameter of six inches. So we'll, we need the radius because we'll treat this one as a cylinder, whereas this one's a cone. And we'll have the uh, radius, I need the height, let's call it H sub P for a uh, height of the pot versus height of the filter and radius of the filter. Here's the um, radius of the pot. It's a constant, so I'll label it with a number. Agree? There's the stuff that changes, three things change the radius of the coffee, the height of the coffee in the filter, and the height of the coffee in the pot. Radius of the pot stays the same. Uh, the filter keeps these same dimensions. Actually, I bet we do another similar triangle thing. I can relate R and F by relating radius and height of the filter itself, the three and the six. But there's our picture and we've labeled the parts that change. Step two, um, what was step two specifically? In our notes, write down the numerical information. Step three, write down what you're asked to find. Okay, numerical information. Um, they told us about coffee draining from the filter area, the conical filter. So we'll let the volume of the coffee uh, in the pot be V sub P uh, in the filter, I'm gonna let it be V sub F if that comes up, and it will, but um, we're asked about how fast the level in the pot is rising. So let's introduce V sub P for volume of the pot. And we're interested in the point in time when the rate of change of the volume of the coffee in the pot is 10 cubic inches per minute and Coffee in the cone is five inches deep. That is when H sub F equals five inches, the conical filter. So these are things we know, by the way. Uh, the rate of change of volume in the pot's positive. Rate of change of the volume of the coffee in the filter is negative, when it drains from the filter into the pot. The question is, how fast is the level in the pot rising? We label that with H sub P level height because we were dealing with either a cylinder or a cone. The H sub P dt equals what? What's the rate of change of the, the depth of the coffee in the pot, the H sub P? When the rate of change of volume in the pot is 10 cubic inches per minute and H sub F equals five inches. All right, so we got a mixture of pot information and filter information. What's next? Step four, need a relationship between the things that change. Who's the most important variable to you? 
uh, H sub P because we're asked a question about H sub P. So we need to relate H sub P to the other variables. Okay, this one's a little exotic because there's two, two geometric things here. There's the, the cone and the cylinder, the filter in a pot. In the pot, idealized as a cylinder, we have the volume is uh, pi r squared h, volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. Um, r was three, it was fixed for the pot. So we plug in three inches there. Uh, the height, well, it varies. So volume of coffee in the pot is nine, three squared, nine pi h sub p cubic inches as a function of time and it changes. So that's how the volume is related to the height of the coffee in the pot. So there's a relationship. Uh, it only involves V sub P and H sub P. Nice. Uh, gee, I don't see the H sub F playing a role down here. It'll play a role in the other part. So we'll differentiate this formula with respect to time. We've got a relationship between the volume and the H sub P we know how fast the volume changes. We're asked about how fast the H sub P changes. And by the way, you've got this volume just as some multiple of the H sub P parameter. That multiple is nine pi. So the rates of change will satisfy that same formula. Differentiate both sides of that formula with respect to time. We get D V sub P dt equals the derivative of nine pi H sub P with respect to T. So we just get uh, derivative of the H sub P. No exotic stuff. If it was H sub P squared, it'd be more complicated, but it's not. So differentiate both sides with respect to T. Solve for D H sub P dt, because that's the thing you're interested in. In other words, divide both sides by nine pi. So we get one over nine pi DV sub P dt. Uh, a little extra letters because I got the pot and the filter thing going on with the subscripts, but it's quite similar to what we did in the tank problem. Actually, it's a little bit easier than the conical tank we did previously. We've differentiated step five. Step six is time to plug in numbers. All right, we know the rate of change of volume of coffee in the pot is 10 cubic inches per minute. Uh, we know H sub F equals five inches, but that's, that's not really relevant, though that is a point in time that they're talking about. So that doesn't affect this particular computation because there's no H sub Fs there. So we'll plug that information in. We'll get dH sub P dt equals one over nine pi, uh, dV sub P dt, which we know to be 10 cubic inches per minute. So we'll put the 10 in there. Um, cubic inches uh, per minute. Let's see, how do I explain away the units here? We get inches per minute. Um, dV sub P dt is measured in cubic inches per minute. You see a square inches in that nine pi somewhere? It's there. I claim we're dividing by square inches, leaving us with inches per minute. Is that right? dH sub P dt, rate of change of the depth of the coffee should, should be inches per minute. The units are right. Um, it's positive. Yeah, well, coffee's going into the pot, so the level's rising. Uh, the H sub F played no role, but I still owe you an explanation. What do you mean there's, there's square inches in the denominator? Where'd that nine come from? Let me back up. Right there. Volume in the pot was pi radius squared. That's three inches squared. There's actually a square inches that comes in with this nine. There's a square inches stuck on that nine. There's another inches on the H sub P. That's why the whole thing is measured in cubic inches. So there's actually square inches down here and we do indeed get inches per minute. The units make sense. The fact that it's positive makes sense. The magnitude is, is awfully complicated and I have to track through the calculus again. But there's another one. Relating rates, following the steps, draw a picture, label stuff. Write down what you know in terms of the variables you've introduced. Write down the question in terms of those variables. Step four, find a relationship between those variables. 
If they gave you a cone, probably something related to cones. Volume of a cone could be surface area of a cone, I suppose. Probably volume of cone for what we'll do. Uh, if they gave you a cylinder, maybe it's volume of cylinder. They gave us both of those in this one, but it was the cylinder we were interested in in part A. <clears throat> in part B, I think it's the cone part. Part B says, how fast is the level in the cone falling at this point in time? Uh, the point in time was given really by, what was it, H sub F equals five inches, I think it was. So part A, draw a picture, or part one, draw a picture. We did that in part A. Uh, let's let the volume of the coffee um, in the pot be V sub P and in the filter be V sub F so that we get the relationship rate of change of coffee in the filter with respect to time, it's gonna be negative, we'll throw a negative sign on there, that equals a rate of change of the volume of the coffee in the pot with respect to time, equals negative, or I'm sorry, equals 10 cubic inches per minute at the point in time when H sub F equals five inches at least. But I introduce a negative sign between the rate of change of the volume in the filter versus the volume in the pot because the coffee's leaving the conical filter and entering the pot it exits here, it enters there, one of them's negative, the other one's positive. Uh, in fact, D V sub F D T must be negative 10 cubic inches per minute. Take the negative to the other side. Yeah, 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 the volume of the coffee in the filter, the conical filter is decreasing. So its rate of change is negative. So there's what we know. What's the question? How fast is the level in the cone falling then? Okay, so the question is DH sub F D T equals what? At this point in time, uh, we've got those rates of change to be 10 cubic inches per minute. And we've also got this H sub F equals five inches. We didn't use that in the last one. I bet we do in this one because this is about the filter and that's a parameter associated with the filter. Step four, find a relationship between the relevant variables. All right, who's relevant here? Um, volume of the filter, and the H sub F, the height, if you like, of the filter. Oh, sorry, the coffee. I didn't label them H sub C's because there's coffee in the pot and the filter. But probably I should say H sub F is the, um, it's the height of the cone of coffee. How about that? V sub F is the volume of the coffee. So I need a relationship between V sub F and H sub F. Uh, might involve R sub F. We need to relate H sub F to the other variables. Uh, well, the big variable of interest is that volume of the coffee in the filter. Uh, for a cone of radius R and height H, we get a volume of one third pi R squared H. Here we're talking about the cone of coffee, which has a radius, as we labeled it, of R sub F, has a height of H sub F, so we get the volume of the coffee in the filter is one third pi r sub f squared h sub f. Uh, this reminds me a bunch of that conical tank problem we just did. Uh, it's got r sub f's in it. I don't know anything about r sub f. But wait, just like in the conical tank, I know the shape of the filter. Similar triangles. In this filter, we've got a cone of three inches base radius it's called, and height six inches. Well, when you fill it up with a fluid, just like with a tank, so this time the fluid's coffee, it's gonna take us the similar shape. It'll be a cone of coffee that has dimensions proportional to the dimensions of the tank. In other words, take a cross section by similar triangles. We have R sub F divided by H sub F equals three inches divided by six inches. R sub F divided by H sub F equals three over six inches cancel. Or if you like, R sub F equals H sub F over two. Uh, rearrange this, uh, this is one half and we get R sub F is H sub F over two. Let's substitute that in up here and let's take, um, let's take R sub F out of the conversation. To get V sub F is one third pi, um, R sub F H squared H sub F, R sub F, replace it with H sub F over two. Simplify and you get that. Why, why would you do this? Because I don't know nothing about R sub F. I know stuff about H sub F. 
and, and I, at least I know this from the shape of the filter, I know how R sub F and H sub F are related. You want a part C on this one? When we get done with this, I could ask you, how fast is the radius of the coffee changing then at this point in time? And then you'd finish it like we did part C of that, that tank problem or the, the part of the tank problem that talked about rate of change of the radius of the surface of the water. So we can do the same thing here. We go back to this relationship, in fact. But my motivation in eliminating R sub F is I don't know nothing about R sub F. And this time they didn't ask me anything about R sub F. So get rid of R sub F because you can. Then we can express the volume of the coffee in the filter as 1 12th pi H sub F cubed. Uh, uh, give me a little break here on the units. Yeah, yeah, that'll be cubic, um, cubic inches. Looks like inches is what we're measuring distance in. Step five, we found the relationship. Now do the calculus. So we didn't touch calculus other than symbolically until now in this second part. Differentiate with respect to time implicitly. Okay, that'll give us a dv sub f dt equals uh, differentiate over here. Uh, 1 12 pi, we get a 3 8 sub f squared d 8 sub f dt chain rule. I've simplified the 3 and the 12. Uh, leave us with a one fourth, so we get one fourth pi h sub f squared d h sub f dt. Solve for d h sub f dt. Uh, divide both sides by this coefficient. Uh, I leave it to you to convince yourself of the arithmetic. It's correct. We get d h sub f dt equals uh, four times the rate of change of the volume over pi h sub f squared. There's the relationship between the rates. That's the name of the section. You ready to plug in? You know dv sub f dt? Yeah, it was, uh, it was, we're looking at the filter, it was negative 10 cubic inches per minute. That's how fast the coffee was draining, draining from, so it's negative, from the filter. Uh, you know h sub f at this point in time? Yeah, it was uh, five inches. I don't see it in front of me, but the point in time they were interested in was when the depth of the coffee was five inches. So when H sub F equals five inches. So then plug those in. We know dV sub F dt, negative 10 cubic inches per minute. We can relate it to the pot. I don't want to talk about the pot in part B. This was a story about the, the filter, the conical filter. H sub F equals five inches. Plug that in. Uh, similar argument about the units. We get inches per minute. Uh, looks like we get negative eight over five pi, approximately negative 0 0.51 inches per minute. Uh, sounds like kind of a slow coffee maker, uh, but um, the units are right. It's a rate of change of the depth of the coffee in the filter, should be distance per time, uh, and it's negative. Yeah, the coffee's draining out of the filter, so the level should be falling. So I'm happy with the units. I'm happy with the negative, the magnitude, you know, usual story. Uh, I'd have to do the calculus again to check the actual value itself. But I am happy with the units and I'm happy with the negative sign. Six steps, always the same thing. Let's do another one. One with some trigging at this time. Story is, on a morning of a day when the sun will pass directly overhead, the shadow of an 80 foot building on level ground is 60 feet long. At the moment in question, the angle theta the sun makes with the ground is increasing at the rate of 0 0.27 degrees per minute. Oh, degrees. At what rate is the shadow decreasing? Express your answer in inches per minute to the nearest tenth. All right, here's their picture. So the sun's gonna be directly overhead. They've given you that, meaning it's, um, it's moving straight upward, you know, it's arch arching upward in the sky. Uh, if it's moving at some odd angle, which in reality it's gonna do, uh, that's gonna affect how the, the, re the relationships we get and how the length of the shadow changes with, perspective, with respect to the altitude of the sun. Uh, but they've set it up where we've got the sun moving um, higher in the sky, from which we'll be able to set up a relationship between the length of the shadow, there's the length of the shadow, this angle theta that describes the um, altitude of the sun, 
in the height of this building. I think what happens is sun's rising and they made a big deal out of it by talking about morning time. So the sun's rising, sun's getting higher in the sky. So theta is increasing in size and that shadow is getting shorter. So in the end, the rate of the shadow is decreasing. Yeah, the, the rate of change of the length of the shadow should be negative. Okay. So, uh, maybe step zero, all these guys, they've, um, they're mixing together units. Let's see, they're giving us um, a rate of change of the angle in degrees per minute. And we got to express angles in terms of radians. And also they've given us the height of the building and the length of the shadow in feet. Okay, um, bad test question in calculus, maybe good physics question, but a bad calculus test question, in my opinion, um, to have you have to mess with the units. Um, I would I would never mix units together uh, in a calculus one test for you. I mean, you got enough problems without me mixing feet and minutes and giving you degrees. But let's illustrate it. It ain't that hard, and we got we got plenty of time, right? So we need to deal with the fact that there's feet and inches mixed together, and we definitely got to deal with the fact that they've given us degrees. So a warning up front before we get to step one, step one being draw a picture. So here's a picture that kind of simplifies things. I don't need all our perspectives and stuff. Let's label this S because that's the length of the shadow. The building's 80 feet tall, and this is angle theta. They told us that. Presumably the building's vertical. So we get a right angle and we got ourselves a right triangle. Excellent. Um, you want to use a Pythagorean theorem, you think? Probably not. That involve uh, the distance from the end of the building to the tip of the shadow. That doesn't really have anything to do with what they told us about. I want to do something that involves the theta because they gave us a rate of change of theta. So probably some trig function. Which trig function? I don't want to talk about the hypotenuse. I want to talk about the opposite and the adjacent. So which trig function? Tangent. Or if you're really stubborn, cotangent. I suspect that'll be the relationship we'll get between theta and S. So in some sense, this one's a little bit easier. You're kind of drawn to the formula that will relate the variables. But first, draw label. We're interested in the point in time, they said, when the shadow was 60 feet long. So as we've labeled it, when S equals 60 feet, and the rate of change of theta with respect to time is 0 0.27 degrees per minute. Can't have that uh, because this is calculus and we're going to take derivatives. Sound then like we're going to take the derivative of a tangent function. <clears throat> What's the derivative of tangent of theta? Well, it's secant squared theta if you measure theta in radians. So get rid of this degrees uh, by multiplying by the conversion factor pi radians per 180 degrees. We saw that maybe in chapter one. But this is the conversion from radians, uh, radians per degree. So it converts degrees into radians. Notice no units on the radians as usual. Uh, multiply by pi over 180, uh, 0 0.27, that is a 0 0.0015 pi radians per minute. Remember, radians are unitless. Uh, I must have got that out of the calculator to do that ugly arithmetic, but there's a precise value. Otherwise, I'd have an approximation on there. Here's d theta dt um, in terms of radians per minute. All right, so this is what we know. What was the question? The question was, how fast is the length of the shadow changing? When uh, S equals 60 feet and d theta dt equals this uh, in terms of radians per minute. We need to relate S and theta. I'm like in tangent. I'm like in tangent and um, not so much cotangent, but I could use cotangent. If you were sufficiently stubborn, you could use sine and cosine, but you'd have to find the length of the hypothesis, which is 80 squared plus S squared, square root of. Now you're gonna have something that's monstrous to differentiate. Uh, so the easy thing is tangent theta. Tangent of theta, 
opposite over adjacent. It's 80 over S, or if you like, 80 S to the negative one. So I'll simplify my use of the chain rule here. All right, so there's the formula. Step five, differentiate. Differentiate tangent theta with respect to T. Derivative of tangent secant squared. Chain rule sticks a d theta dt on here. Good thing. We know about d theta dt. We had um, 80 s to the negative one. Bring the negative one out front. Subtract one from the exponent. We get negative s to the negative two. Respect the chain rule. We get a ds dt stuck on the end. Solve for ds dt in terms of this other stuff. You will get that. Just leave it at that. Um, do you know all these things? Step six, it's time to plug in. Uh, do you know S? Yeah, it was 60 feet. Uh, you know d theta dt? Yeah, it was like 0 0.0015 pi, I think. Do you know secant theta? Ooh, I don't know secant theta. So we'll have to deal with that. So we still got some information that we got to find, as often happens in related rates questions. <clears throat> Okay, when x equals 60 feet, well, we can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the, that hypotenuse. At that point in time, we had a 60-foot shadow, an 80-foot building, crunch the numbers, you'll get a 100-foot um, hypotenuse. It's the distance from the top of the building to the tip of the shadow. Well, anyhow, it's the hypotenuse in that right triangle at this point in time, because it changes. Well, then we can find the secant. Secant would be hypotenuse over adjacent. Hypotenuse is 100. Adjacent would be the length of the shadow. Think of the picture. We get 100 feet over 60 feet. The feet's cancel. We get 5 thirds. So secant of the theta is 5 thirds. What's theta? <clears throat> I don't care unless I need theta. Do I need theta? I don't need theta. I need the secant of theta. And I got the secant of theta. Just a quick observation. Don't find stuff you don't need. We needed the secant of theta. We found the secant of theta. What's that tell you about theta? I don't care what that tells me about theta. I don't need theta. I needed the secant of theta, and I found the secant of theta. So don't find things you don't need. Use your time efficiently. So let's see. We can plug in now. So we've got um, S was 60 feet. We see secant theta at that point in time is 5 thirds. They gave us a d theta dt. We've converted it to the appropriate units. So we get the following. Um, ds dt would be um, negative 60. Here we go, negative 60 squared. Uh, secant was 5 thirds. That gets squared. We got the 80 in the denominator. Um, d theta dt was 0 0.0015 pi. Simplifying that, we get this number here if it means anything to you. Uh, feet per minute, let's see if we can convince ourselves it's feet per minute. Rate of change of the length of the shadow, yeah, it, it should, be, um, should be feet per minute. Oh, damn it, I dropped a negative sign again, and it should be negative. Uh, it's twice I made that mistake in these notes. I will fix it twice. Uh, it should be negative because the shadow's decreasing. So negative, uh, feet per minute, units sound right. You believe these units? What we got here? Uh, S was measured in um, feet, the 80, it was measured in feet as well. Uh, the d theta dt was measured in per minutes. So we've got feet squared over feet per minute. That's, yeah, that's feet per minute. The units are correct. I'm happy with the units. Glad I keep checking. Whoopsie, I dropped a negative sign there. That's bad. Should be decreasing. Yeah. The sun's getting higher in the sky and the shadow's getting shorter. So yeah, it definitely should be negative. I've messed up there. I need a negative there. Um, they wanted the answer and what was it? Inches per minute. Okay, so I'll multiply by 12 inches per foot to do that conversion. We'll get inches per minute and I've left the negative signs off down here as well. Uh, if I was grading this, I'd, I'd remove a point from you. Yeah, you should catch that upon the final step seven, thinking to see if your answer makes sense. Mine doesn't because it's positive, and I know that shadow's getting shorter, so I've dropped a negative sign, so bad professor. Um, so there you go. It's approximately seven inches per minute. Does that make any physical sense to you that the shadow's decreasing at a rate of seven inches per minute? Um, 
it's plausible, I suppose. The fact that it's inches per minute or, or feet per minute, uh, and the fact that it's, when I correct it, it's negative. Those parts I'm happy about. Again, the units, I can't see that. I got all this calculus stuff before I can check that, that magnitude of that number actually makes sense. But there's your one involving um, trig functions. All right, I think we got two more. Here's another one related to something somewhat exotic, it's related to the law of cosines. It says two ships are streaming straight away from a point O along routes that make a 120 degree angle. Ship A moves at 14 knots, nautical miles per hour. The nautical mile is 2,000 yards. Information I think we can do without. Ship B moves at 21 knots. How fast are the ships moving apart when OA equals five and OB equals three nautical miles? All right, so a picture would certainly be helpful in turning all that, all that verbiage into some math. Okay, well, here's the picture. Let O be the point, um, they're, they're steaming straight away from, so one boat, ship A, goes in one direction, ship B goes in another direction, and there's a 120 degree angle. How do they word it? Routes that make a 120 degree angle. So there's a 120 degree angle along uh, between this edge and this edge of the triangle we're making. Uh, let's label this side A because they tell us Ship A moves at 14 knots, so that would be the rate of change of this length here. DA, DT would be 14 nautical miles per hour, 14 knots. Uh, they tell us ship B moves at 21 knots, so let's label this side, lowercase b, that's the distance of this side, length of this side. So DB, DT is 21 nautical miles per hour. And they ask us how fast are the ships moving apart? So they want to know how fast this is changing. So let's label that, because it changes. Let's label that with a C. That's the distance from ship A to ship B. They want to know how fast that is changing when um, A equals five nautical miles and B equals three nautical miles. Do you agree this is the picture? Everything changes except 120 degrees. So I labeled everything uh, relevant with variables. Yeah, it's true, this angle changes and that angle changes also. They didn't talk about the headings of the ships relative to each other, anything like that. So that, that I won't label because I don't need it. But they did talk about the distances. Um, so I'll label all three of those distances with variables, with letters, because they change. And I'll label this angle with its value, 120 degrees. Uh, I might want to convert that to radians. Um, it depends how we use it, I suppose. Uh, we're going to use the law of cosines in this. I'll need a relationship between the lengths of the sides and we'll use the law of cosines. Uh, actually, I'll be able to deal with a 120 degree angle because it's going straight into a trig function, a cosine function. So there's the picture that describes the story. Um, we are told, the information we're given, step two, is that DADT is 14 knots, ship A moves at 14 knots, nautical miles per hour. I'll probably be a little more loosey-goosey on the units in this one because they've used knots or nautical miles. They just said something about yards that we don't need. Uh, DBDT, rate of change of B is 21 knots. Uh, we're interested in a point in time when A equals five nautical miles and B equals three nautical miles, this information here. So draw a picture, label the stuff that changes, everything but that angle changes uh, with variables. Uh, and the information we're given in terms of those variables is what's in step two. Step three is the question. The question is, how fast are the ships moving apart? So the question is, DC, DT equals what then? Question is, dc, dt equals what? Then, that's when da, dt was 14 knots, db, dt was 21 knots, a was five nautical miles, and b was three nautical miles. You gotta give them this, they told you a bunch of information. 
uh, probably the bad news is you're going to need most of it. So um, when we do the differentiation, there must be a lot of moving parts <laughs> in uh, the resulting equation. So step four, we need to relate A, B, and C, and, and probably the 120 degree angle. Why, the law of cosines does exactly that. Not that I expect the law of cosines is on the tip of your brain, but the law of cosines relates the lengths of the three sides of a triangle to one of the angles as follows. Law of cosines implies uh, C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus two AB cosine of the angle opposite side C, in this case, the 120 degree angle. It's a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. It's good in any triangle. We don't got a right triangle. We got a triangle with this 120 degree angle in it. If we had a right triangle, we'd have a cosine of 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 degrees is zero. If we had a right triangle, we'd have C squared equals A squared plus B squared, like Pythagoras meant things to be. So the law of cosines is a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. We need it here because we don't have a right triangle. So we get that relationship. Uh, anyone, anyone, cosine of 120 degrees, it's negative a half. I depend on your knowledge of uh, special angles or your access to a calculator to come up with the fact that that's negative a half. So let's substitute for that. And it turns out having the angle in radians, I'm sorry, in degrees instead of radians, it didn't matter because it, it went straight in a trig function and now it's gone. So we get a negative half out there and the, equa the equation that relates A, B, and C is C squared equals A squared plus B squared um, plus A, B. So there's step four. Uh, it was actually kind of easy because it just came straight from the law of cosines. I mean, the hard part's knowing to use the law of cosines. But there's relationships between A, B, and C. It's time to differentiate implicitly with respect to time. Differentiate C squared, we get 2C dc dt chain rule. There's loads of chain rules here. Yeah, because there's loads of compositions of functions. A squared, B squared, let's just say similarly differentiate. You get the dA dt, the dB dt. Uh, A times B. The product, I have to use a product rule. There's my square brackets and a picture of the product rule. Derivative of the first A times the second B plus the first A times the derivative of the second B with respect to T for all derivatives. Okay, um, let's see. We're looking for dc dt, the rate of change of the distance between the ships. So let's divide through by 2C and then we get dc dt equals this stuff here. Uh, these twos canceled and we're left with twos in the denominator over here. There's what you get for dc dt in terms of all the other stuff. Do you know all the other stuff? Do you know a, b, c, da dt, db dt? You know all those, right? I don't think you know c. All right, but we can find it. So I want to substitute in, but I don't know everything just yet. I know the DADTs, the DBDTs, I know A, I know B. I need to know C as well. All right, so uh, we'll have to find C. When A is five nautical miles and B is three nautical miles, we have the relationship from the law of cosines. We had C squared is A squared plus B squared minus two AB cosine of that angle. That simplifies down, uh, let me not read all the arithmetic to you, simplifies down to C squared equals 49. So we take C to be seven nautical miles of the units. You wouldn't take the negative seven, which is also a solution to that equation because we're talking distances. Distances are non-negative. Distances are non-negative. So now we can plug in. We know um, A to be five at the point of interest. We know B to be three at the time of interest. Uh, we now know C to be seven at the time of interest. Uh, by the way, all these distances are measured in nautical miles, so uh, those nautical mile units cancel. We're left with uh, the units of the D whatever DTs, which would be knots, so the answer comes out knots or nautical miles per hour.
This one, like I said, the, the units are a little exotic, so you might feel less comfortable with these, uh, but we'll get knocked out for the answer when all the dust settles. Substitute all those numbers in, we get 59 over two knots. That's what, um, 29 and a half. Uh, nautical miles per hour, let's see. Uh, does that make sense? I'm looking for the information. Does that make sense? 29 nautical miles per hour. Oh, it's positive. Okay, that part makes sense given the picture. Uh, the units are right. How about the magnitude? What was the story? How fast is ship A moving? Uh, D80 T was uh, 21 knots. Ship B was moving. No, sorry, I read that wrong. Ship A is moving at 14 knots. Ship B is moving at 21 knots. If they were moving directly apart, they'd be going, what, 35 knots, 35 nautical miles per hour, if they were headed in opposite directions. That's the fastest the rate could be, is 35 knots. We got 29 and a half knots. Well, it's not too big. Uh, it's positive when they could be headed towards each other, and I could put a bound on that, be, what, negative seven knots. Um, that's not the case, I know from the picture, but I can get an upper bound. Let's do it because I can, and I can't always eyeball these and get upper bounds on the answers. Yeah, since one's going 14 knots and the other one's going 21 knots, the largest the distance between them could be changing is the sum of those 35 knots. And it's not that because they're not going directly away from each other. Well, it's slightly less than that. You know, the sign makes sense. It's positive because they're moving apart. The units make sense. And this time the magnitude is plausible. I mean, there could still be something subtly wrong with it, but the units, uh, the, the size of the answer actually makes some physical sense this go round. So that one uh, actually turned out to be somewhat easier because of the law of cosines. That did all the heavy lifting in terms of finding relationships between variables. One last one, um, one that's slightly more abstract uh, and also <clears throat> one that step four is going to be relatively easy, making the whole problem not quite as hard as some of that stuff with the cones and cylinders and stuff. The story is a particle moves along the curve y equals x to the three halves in the first quadrant in such a way that its distance from the origin increases at the rate of 11 units per second. Find dx dt when x equals three. Uh, three units, I guess. Okay. Um, well, let's draw a picture. The only thing I can think to draw is a curve. Y equals X to the three halves. It looks uh, uh, it looks like half of a parabola. It's not, but it's it's crudely shaped like that. I really just need kind of a schematic so I can, can label stuff that changes. And the things that change are the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, and anything else. Distance from the origin. So I probably should have put a little line here to indicate the distance from the origin. Uh, let's introduce that. So we've got a point that varies, the point x of t, y of t, and I know y uh, is a function of x, is x to the 3 halves. So we get a point of the form x, x to the 3 halves. Let capital D be the distance of that point to the origin, because they talk about that, the distance from the origin. So we'll introduce a capital D to represent that distance. Capital D, not a lowercase d, because we're gonna have Ds all over the place when we differentiate. So let's use a capital D to represent that distance. So here's a picture. There's the things that change. X changes, um, Y changes like this in relation to X, and D changes. We'll have to find D in terms of X here in a little while, not a problem. The question is, uh, find dx dt, dx dt equals what? When x equals three, when x equals three units. And they also told us the distance from the origin, what we've called capital D, increases at the rate of 11 units per second. So they've told us d capital D dt equals 11 units per second. With the symbols I've introduced, that's the information we know. That's why the capital D. So D, 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 T equals 11 units per second positive. Step four, find a relationship. 
Can you relate D to X or X and Y? Yeah, it's just a distance from the origin to this point. This point is of that form. I can find that. We need the distance formula or the Pythagorean theorem, which is based on the distance formula. Or, sorry, the distance formula is based on the Pythagorean theorem. That's why the squares and the square roots and the distance formula. But we get the relationship that the distance to the origin squared is the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate squared. Let's go back and look at the picture. The distance from here to here is the x coordinate squared plus the y coordinate squared. Those things form a right triangle. So we get d squared equals x squared plus y squared. Um, I, I know y in terms of x. So I think I went ahead and differentiated it as is and then substituted. Might have been clever to substitute and then differentiate. So, uh, so differentiate, we got the relationship. Step five, differentiate it with respect to t. Derivative of d squared with respect to t. Chain rule. Composition of functions, the squaring function and the capital D function, a function of time. Differentiate with respect to time, we get 2d dd dt. Similarly with the x squared and the y squared, 2x dx dt, 2y dy dt. All right, uh, I like plug numbers in now, but I don't know all the numbers. We know the relationship y equals x to the three halves. So we can find dy dt as, just differentiate with respect to t, three halves x to the one half, dx dt. So there's dy dt in terms of x. So I can go in here and substitute for the y and the dy dt. If I just substituted before I differentiated, I wouldn't have to do this. And we get um, 2d dd dt equals 2x dx dt. There's that. Plus 2y. Well, y is, um, so I'll leave it as y for a second, but I can substitute an x to the three halves. I will in a second dy dt is this quantity here, so I put that in for dy dt. Or, uh, let's see, we can factor a dx dt out of this, leaving us with a 2x from the first term, a, um, oh, the twos cancel here, leaving us with a 3y x to the 1 half, 3yx to the 1 half. So factor the dx dt out. Finally, um, let's do some substitution for that y. y equals x to the 3 halves. So I've made the substitution there. We also the, solve this for dx dt. So dx dt is the left hand side divided by this. So there's the division and the substitution for the y in that step. And dx dt equals, let's see, 2d over 2x plus, multiply out here, you get 3x squared, yeah, 3x squared, d, 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 t. There's the relationship between the rates, the name of the section. Uh, you might want to do that in a slightly different way. Uh, that's fine. It would have been clever of me to really substitute for x, the expression of y in terms of x up here, and the differentiation would have been easier, but this is correct. Um, I don't always see them the easiest way on the first try. That's a relationship between the rates. We just need D, X, and D, 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 T. They told us X equals three. All right, we'll have to find D when X equals three units. When X equals three units, Y being related to X by this formula is three to the three halves power. And so D, I've got d in terms of x and y. We'll take a square root to find d itself. d is a distance, so it's positive, positive square root. Uh, the x quantity squared, the y quantity squared, that simplifies down to capital D equals six units. I didn't tell us what the units were. They just use the word units. So I stuck that in there. So when x is three units, we got the x. We can find d to be six units, and they told us d d d t is 11 units. Substitute that information in, simplifies down to four. The, un the units will be this unknown units per second because it's a rate of change of X. So that one was all symbols and not something physical, but uh, I don't know, arguably, maybe it's a little bit easier because I just find relationships from a distance formula or for the Pythagorean theorem. 
and differentiate as always. Um, I might need to go back and find extra information. In that last step, I'm gonna substitute in, well, it depends what they gave us as to whether I know all of that information. Sometimes I gotta go back and find extra things. We've done it, I don't know, probably about half the time. We had to find something before we could plug in all the numbers. There was still some unknowns, but we had the information upstairs to find those unknowns. And that is related rates. Let's see, we just had a pile of examples. There you go. Uh, in the classroom component to this, we'll just work loads and loads of these examples. You will be asked on a test <clears throat> to follow these six steps. For one thing, it helps you work them to do them very stepwise. And for another, if you don't get all the way, it helps, it helps you get partial credit. It's easier to tell where you got stuck. If you'll do it, if we always do these step by step, and any examples we do in class, we'll do according to these six steps. And any examples uh, we do in the study session day, we'll do according to these six steps. And anything you do on the test, you'll do according to these six steps. So we'll just make it routine, and that'll help you with this. This isn't easy. You need to practice these. This is pretty tricky stuff. I still think the trickiest part is finding the relationship. It's gonna be a formula you're given. Uh, which the one with the law of cosines was roughly that. You just kind of had the formula there. Uh, those involving maybe volumes or surface areas are usually formulas you just have. The trickier ones are the ones where you set some things up with triangles and you end up having to fiddle around with similar triangles and finding the relationships becomes a bit trickier in those. So practice lots of them. We'll do lots of examples in the, the in-class component of, of this. So have a nice day. We got one section left in chapter three, and then we'll be we'll be well over halfway through the stuff. Have a nice day. I'll see you soon. Bye bye.